Well, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 20th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everybody to switch off their mobile devices as they do affect the broadcasting system? Agenda item one is items in private. Can I seek the agreement of the committee to take item four in private to allow the committee to consider a paper on its draft budget scrutiny 2015-16? Is that agreed? Yeah. That is agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is homelessness in Scotland. <clears throat> um, the committee's, this is the committee's follow-up inquiry on homelessness in Scotland. In 2011-12, the committee conducted an inquiry into the Scottish Government's commitment to abolish the priority need test from the assessment of homeless applications. The committee undertook in its report to, quote, monitor the implementation of the com commitment for the remainder of the parliamentary session and address any issues of concern which may emerge. So as part of this work, we will today hear from four homelessness representative groups, and I now welcome Robert Allridge, Chief Executive of Homelessness Action Scotland, Rosemary Brocci, Policy and Research Manager, Shelter Scotland, Robert Gowans, Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland, and Gary Burns, Prevention of Homelessness Caseworker from the Govan Law Centre. So can I welcome you all. Um, We'll move just straight on to questions. So um, just to kick off, can I ask, in general, can you make some brief comments on the impact of the abolition of priority need um, and the implication that has had on the outcomes for homeless people in Scotland? Robert, would you like to start? Thanks, Thank you. Um, well, th thanks very much for the question. I, I think one of the... the important things to remember in this is that there's been a long process. Uh, the, the legislation, original legislation was passed in 2001 and 2003 and there's actually been a long process of uh, local authorities adjusting to the abolition of priority need which uh, was finally implemented at the end of 2012. So there hasn't been a, a big bang or a sudden change for people. It's been a gradual process and part of that has in, involved really a, a, an embedding of a change of culture towards how homeless people are dealt with, which I think has been extremely positive. And I think it is pretty well ingrained now that people are looking for long-term outcomes for homeless people in general. There are obviously some uh, specific areas where we think there's uh, more attention needed, and I'm sure we'll come on to that in questions later on. But overall, I think we're getting far better assessments of homeless people's needs, better support for homeless people, uh, and uh, with some exceptions, a real uh, um, change in attitude, which has been uh, sort of welcomed right across Europe. We're, we're involved in a number of uh, uh, European organisations who look to Scotland as a beacon. So I think it's really important that we're monitoring this. We keep a close eye on it and we don't take our eye off the ball. But I think in general, it's been a very, very positive impact over, over the 10 years, not just over the year. Uh, yeah, I think I'd echo everything Robert said there. In a sense, we're not just looking at the, the transition date and the end of December in 2012 to, to remove priority need, but actually everything that happened up to that point. But we also should remember that it's not just that 10-year lead-in, that, that, that we also need to be looking beyond the 2012 deadline and saying, I just as this committee is, what is the ongoing impact and what are the ongoing um, issues for, for people who are, are, are presenting as homeless? One of the things that Shelter Scotland is very keen to, to stress is that at the moment in Scotland, with the, the advent of the housing options approach and the focus being on that, perhaps some of the attention towards how homelessness services are being developed and delivered isn't there. And what we've been calling for is a, a new 10-year action plan that really takes us from, from now for the next 10 years so we have a new set of actions and a new set of priorities um, to make sure that people who are approaching their uh, council because they're having a housing crisis are actually being dealt with and, and getting the right outcomes for them. In general, though, if you're looking specifically at what the impact of priority need 
removal has been on people. One of the, the key things that we've seen is that there is obviously an increase in the number of people who are now owed a duty um, within certain categories. So, for example, um, tw in 2013 and 14, 62% of households assessed as homeless and in priority need were single adults over 18, and that's compared in 2006-7, where it, single adults over 18 made, made up only 46% of households. And obviously that increase in the number of certain uh, types of people who are entitled to a homelessness duty has had knock-on consequences for local authorities trying to house them. So perhaps we can explore some of that as we, we go on through the questions. Um, as a, a frontline practitioner, uh, we always struggled with this priority need and it was always, we always felt that you know, becoming homeless immediately made you vulnerable, so that there was a priority there, if not in the, in the legal sense. So we welcomed the Scottish Government abolishing it, and it was really progressive. But I, I guess, like with all public policy, the, the attentions and the detail on how that's, that's how that's brought out, and, and there's, I think there'll be a bit of an impact when the housing regulator reports on how local authorities, when they haven't been offering people accommodation, I think the figures in there may well tell us a. a a story about what the impact has actually been because in paper it's great but it's about the detail and, and we need to wait until I think it's the end of August that comes out but as a bit of public policy we were in support of it and, and think that it was showed how progressive Scotland is in dealing with homelessness legislation. Um, certainly over the last few years the, um, the proportion of uh, cases that um, assistance advice bureaus across the country advise on related to homelessness has gone down um, from sort of 1.25 percent of all cases um, a couple of years ago down to 1.19 um, percent. That's still sort of just under 6,700 cases across Scotland each year, so it's a it's a fair amount. Um, but particularly if you consider the the wider context um, that we see sanctions, food banks, payday loans, zero hours contracts, the bedroom tax and rent arrears, um, then it's, sort of, it's quite a remarkable success story. That being said, I think there's, there's room for improvement and um, certainly as seeing housing options bedding in, um, there, are, there are areas that, um, that can be improved upon. Um, but I think on the whole, um, I think it's, um, I think sort of the, the fall in homelessness applications across the country is, is, sort of, is a quite a remarkable achievement and I think testament to the, the, the policies that, um, that have been passed. I think in Scotland we're very good at beating ourselves up and I think when we took evidence, I remember we went to Turning Point in Glasgow and um, they said that you know people in the rest of Europe are looking to Scotland. Um, are they copying it? And, you know, I think it's important that we stay ahead of the game. Nothing stands still. So perhaps, you know, during the course of this session, we can see how we can um, stay ahead of the game and, and still be a beacon of, of good practice. Um, Adam, do you want to carry on? Okay. Um, that said, I'm going to look at a downside <laughs> for to kick us off. Um, particularly Shelter and Citizens Advice Scotland, both of you commented in your submissions about the need to examine the increase in the number of intentionally homeless decisions that local authorities are, meeting, are, are making. In particular, the allegation is out there that whether um, a changing use of intentionality decisions is being, avoid, is being uh, used to avoid statutory duty. Yes, I can start on that. When you look at the trend from 2009, you can see that 2009, 10, 3.8% of uh, homelessness assessments were, were assessed as intentionally homeless. And by 2013, 14, that had gone up to 6.2. Over that period, it has risen gradually. And, and clearly, this is something we need to be aware of and a cause for concern. There's no clear evidence, and I think one of the things that we, we would like to see is, is a kind of review and an understanding of, of why intentionally anti decisions are rising. Clearly, when you're in a situation, as many local authorities are, of uh, having a, a, a limited choice of options, the, the number of lets that are becoming available potentially are, are lower, we need to understand how they are uh, making uh, assessing homelessness and, and what the dynamics there are. To, to really guard against uh, what potentially could, 
be seen as a, a gatekeeping approach. Really, I think one of the fundamental things that I'd like the committee to take away from my evidence today is to understand that when, when we're dealing with homelessness, and, and homelessness on the whole um, is, is a serious crisis in most people's lives and should, where it can be, be prevented. But often it can't be prevented, and there are situations where a homelessness uh, assessment and a homelessness decision is the right outcome for that household and a pathway out of a, a period of crisis in their lives and back into stable housing. What needs to go with that is, is support. Um, we need a, a person-centred homelessness service, which is really another way of saying that the needs of that individual should be fully assessed and fully taken into account. But what we also need is a good uh, a range of housing options for that individual and one of those housing options, and for most people in the circumstances, the right housing option will be um, social housing, will be a, a long-term stable let um, in the social rented sector. And across Scotland, we're seeing a decrease in social housing. Um, we, we, we're not seeing the, the level of new house building that we need. And until we really fix that, until there is a, a much stronger focus on a sustainable and an improved house, supply of social housing, we're always going to see these pressures on homelessness services. Um, yeah, I think um, we've seen cases where um, clients have been found to be intentionally homeless. Um, certainly, even the face of it would appear to be um, being inconsistent decision making. Um, and I think that's, um, I think, sort of picking up on on um, the points that the Rosemary Frachi made from um, the national statistics. Um, intentional homelessness decisions have. Um, have risen considerably. That may be due to the, the abolition of priority need. Um, it may be due to some inconsistent decision-making processes. Um, and I think it would be, be interesting to define what the, whether the reason might be, whether um, sort of there's, there's differences between um, policy and practice between different local authorities across the country in terms of how they, they arrive at um, intentional homelessness decisions. Are there particular black spots, or is this why you're calling for a, 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 a monitoring of this across the country? Are you aware that there are particular local authorities who the rise has been significant in terms of uh, the numbers declared intentionally homeless? Our focus is particularly on the on the national picture rather than see the performance of, of individual local authorities. So I don't think that the further investigation would be um, would be helpful in that regard because certainly we wouldn't have sort of the full the full picture at, at local level. But um, it's a, that, that something may be something may be going on. So Gary and Robert like to comment on this this issue as well. Uh, I wonder if I could because I think it, it's it's quite a complex issue. Um, before priority need was abolished, there were the four hurdles that people had to go through, and they were, first of all, asked if they were homeless, and then if they were in priority need, and only if they passed those two hurdles were they then assessed as to whether they were intentionally homeless or not. Now, with the uh, priority need hurdle being abolished, more people will be being asked the question, are you intentionally homeless? So you'd expect some, some change, if you like, in the statistics, because some of the people who'd been, who would have been filtered out before uh, uh, are being filtered out at that stage. However, there are some quite large inconsistencies in the statistics. The, the um, Scottish Government statistics are broken down by local authority and there are some quite large uh, variations. And I think it's important to, to get behind that because I certainly know we, we were in touch with one or two of the, I suppose you might call, outlier uh, local authorities um, who are actually involved in quite good practice, even though they find the homeless person intentionally homeless. They seek to maintain contact, they seek to engage with support, and they seek to find a solution for them. So I think it, it's about understanding that picture a little better rather than simply looking at the statistics. I just one of the, I mean, I think intentionally homeless has certainly went up, but one of the problems that we have intentionally homeless is that whenever we come across a decision in probably maybe about, I've done about 40 in the last two years at Govan Law Centre. There's only been two that I haven't been, una been unable to overturn. So there's a real issue there with, with justice when somebody who knows about the centre, the Govan Law Centre, or they can go to LAC and get an advocate or a solicitor to overturn a decision. But what about the people that 
don't actually have access to that, and that's the major issue that we have. It's and some of the decisions that are made, they're, 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 they're really, really poor, and that's why they're so easy to overturn. So it's pretty clear that the intentionally homeless has been used as a way of, of stopping a service being offered to people who are quite vulnerable. And, and if you're talking about earlier about saying about kind of some, some new ideas, you would say that intentionally homeless is a tool that shouldn't be getting used because if, if we're overturning almost every decision that we get, then surely that means that the decision shouldn't be getting made in the first place. So in terms of, yeah, Rosemary. So, so I just add something. Um, when you look back at what the original Homelessness Task Force recommendations were, there was a whole suite of them, and the abolition of priority need was really only one of those, and it was enshrined in legislation. They also recommended that intentionality decisions, or that the, the intentionality test should also be removed, and the logic for that is still intact. There is still, when you look at, um, at what actually the, the, the needs of somebody who applies as homeless is and what they will get as a result of that, of that determination of, of homelessness, the, the, the choosing to, to say somebody is intentionally homeless really just prevents them from, from having that duty to be rehoused. But they should also still be receiving temporary accommodation. They should be looking um, to get certain types of housing support to enable them in future to, to avoid homelessness again and move out of that period of crisis. And so I think one of the things that, that we should be doing in terms of looking at the next 10 years and what do we, what do we seek to achieve is going back and saying, if in 2001, 2002, the task force said we should be removing the intentionality test. Why shouldn't we still be looking at doing that now for the future in Scotland? So you're suggesting a sort of uh, um, bringing the task force back together again to to actually look at the next 10 years in terms of. I where think we certainly need to yes. Focus. We we need we need a, new, a renewed focus and a renewed plan. And uh, you know, Shelter Scotland has published a, a paper which I'm sure we can share with the committee called "People Not Progress" po so process that really says that what, what we should be focusing in the future is yes, we have rights now enshrined that that are, are very strong and as as um, Ms. Watts suggested, are recognised across Europe. But we actually now need to get that right on the ground and we need to look at the way that service is delivered to make sure it's person-centred and integrated and that we have a very tailored service for at-risk groups. In the meantime, um, how do we stop this gatekeeping, apparent, alleged gatekeeping in terms of the intentionality um, assessment? <coughs> how, how would we do something about that in the short term? If, if, I mean, basically, these decisions have been made by, by workers who are supposed to be trained in homelessness and housing legislation. If they are erroneously making decisions, then it's a case for further training or, or for, for, for some information to be given to them so that they can make the right decisions. But, but I fear that it's not actually the individual worker who's, who's the, where the problem's coming from. I think that the problem is because it's coming from higher up, it's coming from management, but there's pressures on accommodation, and it's expected that, that you know if there's a, a chance that you can exclude somebody from accommodation or from getting a service, then then you go for it, and that's more at a kind of strategic higher level within the local authorities as opposed to the individual workers, because a lot of individual workers don't like making the decisions, but they feel that their hands are tied and that they've been pressured into making these decisions about excluding people from a service. Perhaps when we come on to look at the housing options um, approach that's been taken, because clearly before you get to the point where somebody says, are you intentionally or unintentionally homeless, you have to be allowed to make an, an application as homeless. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so then perhaps, and, and I think this is something that's been backed up by a recent report by the Scottish Housing Regulator, there is also a suggestion that within some local authorities, um, even being able to make an application as homeless could be something that's not offered to you or not made uh, available. And I agree with Gary that often this isn't the, the decision of individual um, uh, caseworkers or individual housing option workers, but actually a decision that's perhaps taken higher up um, and that there is a, a suggestion that that we should be ensuring that the lo each local authority takes a corporate approach to providing the right outcome and the right option for each individual. So we very much welcome the fact that the regulator had suggested and has recommended that the Scottish Government produce guidance for housing options and how it should be implemented. Um, and we know that the government's accepted that recommendation is working to develop guidance. Simply, I would say that we, we would want to be involved in helping to to draft that guidance. And I think 
um, it's very important that, given this conversation that we're having today, that the people who are applying for housing are represented in that process. OK, um, Mary? To follow on with a few questions again around um, housing options. And the Scottish Housing Regulator has found that the implementation of the housing options approach it varies amongst local authorities. Some are, are further ahead with the process than others which has resulted in some homeless people being diverted away from making a homeless application and in turn that leads to an underreporting of homelessness. And I'd be interested if, if you agree with this and how the practice can be improved. I could start that. Yes, we, we do. We, we, we have seen that. And um, in preparing evidence for the committee, we actually did a, a survey of our, our own staff who are dealing with clients and, and dealing with people who are coming to us for help. And what the regulator has suggested in regards to underreporting really does tally with what our, our advice services are seeing. So, um, the, the, where, wherever somebody approaches their local authority for help with housing, usually now what happens is they, they are given an interview to, to look at what their options may be, look at their circumstances and what their options may be. But even with that kind of initial approach, the, the, there is still a statutory duty there to assess homelessness, uh, households for homelessness, where there is reason to believe they might be homeless. And we are concerned that in some cases, people who the statutory duty potentially does apply to aren't having uh, a homelessness assessment. That should always be there. That doesn't necessarily mean that in all cases that the homelessness outcome is, is the right one for them, that there may be other housing options that, that are more appropriate for their circumstances. Because going, making an application for homeless, yes, it entitles you to, to um, the, the, uh, a permanent accommodation and, and the local authority must pr progress a certain um, level of a cer certain numbers of um, responsibilities towards you. But to go into temporary accommodation, to potentially have a long wait in temporary accommodation, to then be offered uh, a housing or a permanent accommodation that might not be what you would choose, might not be the right route, and in fact, entering the private rented sector or going through a housing association and getting a house that way might be, but there should always be the option for people. A statutory duty is there for, to, to have a homelessness assessment. Anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, I, I, I agree. I, again, I think the housing options approach is still very much in its infancy and bedding in, and there are different understandings of what housing options are and different interpretations. And I think sometimes uh, the, 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 the message from strategic level is not understood in the same way at operational level, uh, you know, where people assume that there are targets when there aren't any about reduction in numbers and so on. And I think all that needs to be sorted out as, as the housing options approach uh, evolves and I think because it is so new and because there are these these problems which uh, chime in with our experience as well um, it's very important that the regulator continues to keep um, a close eye upon what is happening and goes back to review uh, uh, how that is developing because I think a one-off report has been extremely useful, but we want to see progress being made and we want to see a bit of pressure being kept on to make sure that housing options uh, as a concept is interpreted in a consistent way across Scotland and in a way which uh, does not allow for gatekeeping, but a, a proper options approach. Of course, linked to that, there's always, are there any options open to people? And that's another question about housing supply and so on. But. Uh, uh, the, the understanding of the housing options approach needs to be, and the implementation needs to be consistent across Scotland. Sorry, sorry, then Rob. Sorry. I think just following up from, from what Robert was saying is that in order to do that, then it should maybe be the responsibility of the Scottish Government to come out and, and define precisely what housing options is, like a, a sort of minimum standard, because some local authorities will do it well and some local authorities don't do it well at all and find they do it really badly and it is used as a gatekeeping and that was came out in the housing regulators report which we've spoken about here i think last month so I, we would say that, that the the homelessness guidance that was brought out by the scottish government i think in 2005 is, is really good and really strong and there, there's no you know if, if a local authority isn't behaving how it should be with its homelessness you can always go back to that as a practitioner and say well here's your responsibilities you've not met them and then they'll need to meet them so I, I, I would suggest that, that you know peg it on to that put something about housing options how that should be done you know and it's not going to be easy of course it's not because there's different local authorities 
have, have issues and they've all got different problems. The urbanised areas have different problems from rural, but there should be some kind of minimum standard, minimum ground, and I would suggest the Scottish Government should consult with both local authorities and with the, the organisations that are sitting here, but also with with people who are, who are tenants, who are living, who have went through the housing options experience and, you know, get the good and the bad and come up with how it should be done. A form of more specific guidance, yeah, which uh, would allow less, I suppose, wriggle room? Yeah, I mean, we spoke about it several times. Ability like, you know, for interpretation across yeah, local authorities? Because, the, I mean, going back to I mean, homelessness guidance for, for a practitioner like myself, it's excellent because whenever the local authority deviates, you can always go back to that. And, and we, we, you know, we have some problems. We don't think everything's great in it. But when you've got that there, when you've got that as a tool, you can always say, well, hold on, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, here's what you should. But that then obviously then opens up an area where some local authorities don't have great advocates, don't have great systems in place for challenging local authority decisions. But that's a different issue completely. I think the Scottish Government released some guidance. Can I add, add one small thing around guidance? I think there's also some confusion uh, amongst local authorities about the guidance because they have to follow the homelessness code of guidance which was obviously published before the housing options approach was uh, uh, developed and there is likely to be some housing options guidance and I think it's quite important that, that the guidance on housing options the guidance and the code of guidance on homelessness are integrated and given that we also have the opportunities of health and social care integration and guidance related to that. Uh, we also have the Children and Young Peoples uh, Act, which has uh, implications for care leavers, which link to homelessness. I think all, all the, the guidance relating to that needs to be looked at uh, so that it integrates and complements each other and that, so that we don't have any, any, any problems in interpretation with local authorities. And, and could I just add as well that we haven't yet mentioned that the government are collecting statistics and figures which we are anticipating being published sometime towards the end of this year, which shows, it's, they're calling it Prevent One, but effectively it's, it's aiming to give a fuller picture of what's happening. With. So currently we have figures that tell us at the point that somebody's made a homelessness application, there's a lot of information connect, collected. But what we don't know is the number of households that are approaching housing options um, team where homelessness is one of the options but actually is not one that's taken. Um, we, we, we need to understand basically much, much more about what happens as a result of the housing options approach to really see and understand whether people are being prevented or, or discouraged from making a homelessness application and what their outcomes are if they're not taking that approach. Rob, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, before? I think certainly we've seen... Um, CAB clients who have been prevented or deterred from making a, a homeless application in some cases because they've been told, well, there's not any temporary accommodation available at the moment, so there's not really a point if you tried these other things. Um, we'd also support um, updated guidance, I think with a view to um, clarifying for local authorities where their various different duties come in. They've got a duty um, towards homeless people, but there's also housing options and where I suppose the, the triggers move towards you would take a homeless application regardless of whether you've got temporary accommodation, regardless of whether, um, um, whether that would mean more work for um, the local authority. I think it would, um, I think it would amplify and, and again lead to, to more consistency across the, across the country and a consistent experience for, for sort of homeless people. The Homeless Action Submission, and I'd be interested, Robert, if you wanted to maybe comment further on it, when you talk about the understanding of housing options within the third sect sector and the variation in practice across the third sector. And I suppose, in particular, I'd be interested in comments around young people in homelessness, because it's more often the, the, the third sector that are involved in helping young homeless people, whether they're care leavers or they've had difficulty at home and, and they've left home. So how can the understanding across the third sector be improved? Is it, would it simply be through guidance or is there something else that could be done? Well, I, I think guidance is, is going to be very important and I would echo what Rosemary has said, that it's important that uh, the, the, the voluntary sector, if you like, and, uh, are involved in helping to shape that guidance uh, uh, b before it's finalised. Um, as far as young people are concerned, it, there's quite an issue about people who don't understand that they may be homeless 
the message hasn't got through, and that's often uh, young people who are sofa surfing, uh, who wait until all the options have run out before they actually think that they can go for assistance, a housing options interview and so on. So there's a bit about education out there, about people understanding what they can do and, and, and that they do have options before they reach the crisis point. Um, as far as involvement, the, the, the voluntary sector is concerned, I think it's a kind of two-way pro process. In some, in some areas, uh, local authorities in the voluntary sector are not uh, as closely involved with each other as, as they could be. And I think, again, that may be something which could be referred to in the housing options guidance. Uh, but I think there's, there's also an onus on voluntary sector organisations as well to ensure that they proactively get involved in discussions about, uh, about housing options. So I think, I think, as I said at the beginning, we're in a very early stage of development of the housing options approach. In some areas, it's gone really well. In others, it's still very embryonic. And I think uh, in the, if we get guidance and, and a bit more assistance for people to, to develop along the right lines, we can address most of the issues of the, the lack of involvement of the voluntary sector and, uh, and also the communication about what rights are and options are. So it's almost about joining all the strands together because you have young people, but you also have perhaps people that are leaving prison. What, what are their options? Where do they go and, and where do they fit in? So all well, of that would need to be pulled together. I, I mean, there is another issue which is um, partly linked to housing options, but is, has been a general issue, indeed, since the days of the task force, which was how to uh, ensure that when people leave institutions, particularly prison, that uh, arrangements are made in advance of them leaving prison so that they don't have to become homeless uh, on, on, on release, which affects the criminal justice budget, uh, amongst other things, because people are more likely to reoffend if they don't have somewhere stable to go to. And I understand there are difficulties because prisons can be overcrowded and need to take quick decisions about releasing some people early. You know, release dates are not always fixed, but I think there is an important role to ensure that uh, prisons are involved and have a responsibility f for the through care, if you like, of people on release and link into the housing options approach to ensure that people don't have to become homeless uh, on, on release from prison, for example. And th the same is true for hospitals. It's often kind of short stay, psychiatric stays and so on, where people end up with nowhere to, yeah. nowhere to stay. Uh, uh, maybe I could add to that, you know, absolutely, this has long been recognised, but I think that, that really over the last 10 years not enough has happened to ensure that targeted specialist services for people who are well known to be at risk, we've mentioned prison leavers, uh, people who are coming out of the care system, um, we have vulnerable people who are repeatedly rough sleeping, um, um, there's, there's a whole range of groups who are extremely you know, well, well evidenced to be overrepresented in homelessness figures for whom targeted specific integrated services need to be developed. Um, Shelter Scotland's got some experience of, of developing these services. We have a, a safe and sound project in Tayside and Fife, which I think we've spoken to the committee about before, which is designed specifically to help people who've had experience of running away as, as children. Um, who we know have, are more at risk of, of homelessness as, as they become adults, um, to actually intervene much earlier to help them escape that, that pathway. Um, we also have a, a supporting prisoners' advice network, um, which we developed in coordination with SACRO, which does exactly what Robert has said, looking at pre-liberation housing advice for prisoners to make sure that, that once they're released, they actually get into a permanent and stable um, home. These kinds of examples, I suppose, we, we need to see a much more coordinated approach and a, mu a much greater emphasis on, on developing that so we don't have that kind of postcode lottery effect where, depending on where you are, you might have access to certain services, um, but that's not the case across Scotland. So we would absolutely welcome, and again, one of the, the, the recommendations that we're making in terms of looking for the next 10 years for Scotland is actually a really strong focus on, on at-risk groups and making sure that there are services developed specifically to meet their needs. Anyone else want to comment on, on that? Young people, you, you recognise that if you can teach good and, and valued lessons for young people uh, when they're young, it stops bad habits being throughout their lives. I think that, that young people services are, are, across the whole of Scotland are completely oversubscribed and there's cases of when young people are put into accommodation that, that's really unsuitable, where they're put into you know what you would think about as traditional hostels.
when it's a young guy at 20, you know, and the things that he's going to be, I mean, it's not that to say that young person's accommodation, things don't go wrong in that as well, but if, you, if you're setting up a young person to fail, if you're putting them into a hostel that's been designed for long-term homeless people with mental health and or addiction problems, you're just putting them into like a lion's den, whereas if there was an, enough accommodation for young people or supported accommodation where a young person can go into a flat with flow and support, that tends to work quite well, and there's a couple of places like that in, throughout Scotland, but there's always a massive waiting list to get young people into that, and if there's a massive waiting list and there's a massive need, then surely we should be talking about increasing the provision, because if it's needed, then it's needed, and we need to put more of the things into young people. Bob, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I think that um, that sort of housing options may have a role to play, um, particularly um, for young people where there's been a family breakdown, and, and we tend to find that um, that young people are far right, um, represented in amongst the clients who come in with a with a homelessness issue, and it's quite often um, as a result of a family breakdown. Um, now, whether that's that's mediation, whether that's sort of into the family and saying, look, this. Um, this is this, the reality of the situation is that likely be in temporary accommodation for quite a long stretch of time it's not necessarily going to be a be a short sharp shock um, sometimes I think that 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 may work work better than others and certainly we see the case where um, where the local authority contacted a um, a client um, who'd um, her mother had, um, had evicted her from the family home. They contacted her mother and said, she may take legal action against you, which wasn't an option she was considering. And when she came back, the locks had been, had been changed. Um, nonetheless, I think mediation would um, may be useful, but it needs to be the, the, the right sort of approach. And I think um, rather than the sort of, um, sort of tailored to fit the situation. And of course, the, there are different pressures on housing in rural and island areas. So, is, is the approach to housing options is, is that advancing at a different pace in rural and island areas? And are there quite specific problems um, there that are being dealt with differently? I mean, clear, clearly, uh, in, in rural areas and in, in island areas, the pressures on accommodation are very different. The, the, the options that are available potentially are very different. And, um, and the committee will be well aware of, of the situation where somebody may have local support networks, which might actually just be isolated to quite a, quite a, a small number of, of, of regions around a particular village or area. If... if they are in desperate need of, of housing and the only housing that's available is many hundreds of miles away, that's going to create problems for them being able to sustain that accommodation. So clearly, um, any housing options approach, we need guidance, we need a strong national framework, but what we need is, is to, an understanding of a local de delivery model that's based on the available options. And I think one of the things that the housing options model is very positive for potentially is, is, is getting a local authority to look at what options are available, maybe be a bit more creative and a bit more... Um, thought through in terms of how to make more housing options become available in particular areas where there is pressure. Okay, thank you. I think, I think if I can just add, there is one particular advantage in smaller uh, local authority areas, and probably in rural areas, which is often the, the teams are smaller and people may know each other better, so the, 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 the opportunity for joint working uh, and, and a close collaborative approach to get a kind of a, 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 a holistic solution is potentially easier in some of these uh, areas than it is in the urban areas with, with vast departments and huge protocols to have to deal with. So. You could say that the rural and island areas have the, kind of the best model and if, if we could roll that out everywhere, we could go a long way to perhaps solving the problem. I, I think it's going to have to be horses for courses mm. because uh, uh, in, obviously in rural areas you may not have a, a, um, enough demand for certain kinds of services for, for, for specialist services to operate. So uh, there will be specialist uh, supported accommodation, more of the urban areas and so on. So I, I think it, it, it's a, quite a complex picture. It's not, you know, rural is good, urban is bad, or urban is good, rural is bad. I think there are good parts from all of them, yeah. Gary or Rob, do you want to comment on that? No. Okay, thank you. I mean, following on from what you said, Robert, um, you know, 
yes, in a smaller area, the teams might be more integrated and, and more well known. Um, I mean, Gary, you obviously, you know, have a specific area where you're um, dealing with, and is the fact that a local authority doesn't have any housing of its own a problem in some areas? Uh, I think absolutely. I think that there's specific problems, and what we're talking about is Glasgow here, so the specific problem with Glasgow is that when somebody becomes homeless and they, they have a duty to be accommodated and they go into a temporary furnished flat, see, Glasgow City Council has, does not have a lot of power in how they mm. then access a house for that person. So, you know, they then need to go to the different housing associations and ask them through a Section 5 referral for accommodation. But there's not a lot of transparency in that process. And, you know, a very an example of that would be that there seems to be some cherry picking, and that's an absolute because I've worked with enough people where you know somebody's been in temporary accommodation, they've had issues, they've maybe 12 months are in temporary accommodation, and they get an offer of a flat, and it's a hard to let area. Whereas you know sometimes we will work with somebody who has who's come into homelessness, but they're working, they just can't find a house, and they get a duty, and that section five referral goes on to a local uh, to a housing association, and that person is housed in a matter of weeks. And there's, there's a bit of unfairness to that. But I think Glasgow City Council has, has a lot of problems in trying to get the housing associations to take people from the homelessness kind of community, I guess, as you would say. And they're trying to fix it, but because they've all got different and competing interests, some housing associations are good at it, some aren't so good. And Glasgow City Council, I guess, is the kind of box clever because they don't want to be you know, irritating or annoying the housing associations because then they won't get anything. And we would like to see some type of statutory instrument for the government where there's some there's there's more of a obligation on housing associations to take in homelessness. And I think that would address quite a lot of the problems in Glasgow, but it would have a knock on effect in other local authorities where there's significant social housing where it isn't always having to go to the local authority but going to the housing associations. Uh, we've spoken to the committee before about this and, and most recently in, in the housing bill which has just passed where we were calling for the section 5 process which Gary's referred to which is no more really than, than filling in a, a form and that data is collected when a local authority is looking to get a, a homeless applicant let, a let through a housing association to formalise that process to make it much more transparent. Gary's absolutely right. You know, we, we now are in a situation where roughly the same number of houses are provided by housing associations as they are in the, in the, in the local authority sector. And so it's not just a problem for Glasgow. Across Scotland, local authorities need to be able to access those uh, housing association lets to make sure that the, the options that they're prov providing to somebody who's homeless are, are available. We increasingly are seeing that local authorities are relying on uh, what's called an informal nomination route, which is picking up the phone to somebody they know in a housing association say, look, I've got this, this person applied as homeless, we owe them a duty, do you have a let for them? And they can share information and share details and allow the housing association come back and say yes or no. We want to see that formalised. The phone call can still happen, but we need a record of on what basis that decision has been made, on what basis they've been accepted or rejected. And not just so organisations like us or the government can monitor and review the extent to which housing associations are contributing to, to helping people out of homelessness, but also so the local authorities themselves can say, well, actually, you know, we've, we've, we've got some great relationships and some very cooperative housing associations and some who really aren't pulling their weight and aren't making lets available, um, and to try and improve those relationships and try and, and make sure that when appropriate, lets are going to, to homeless households from housing associations. We want to see more transparency there, not just for, for national monitoring, but actually so that you know, people like Gary can actually challenge decisions if, if necessary and say, well, Housing Association X has refused my client and the basis on which they've refused them is not a legitimate one. It, it might be because they, they don't quite like the fact that they're not working or, or something along those lines. So we've, again, as I say, repeatedly called for this Section 5 process, which is in law and it's available to all local authorities to use to become mandatory so that we have a, um, you know, a, a data collection and, and the availability of information on, on what's happening um, with, with housing associations. If, if I could just add... We were uh, 
quite concerned when we saw the last set of um, Scottish Government homelessness statistics that the number of lets by home, um, housing associations to homeless households had fallen far in, but by far greater degree than the fall in homelessness presentations. Now, I don't know whether that's... It wasn't broken down in those statistics as to where that was, and I don't know whether it was specific to one or two geographical areas, but I think it was, it was a concern and it's something we need to have a look at. Um, and I would um, echo uh, most of what Rosemary has said. I mean, there are a lot of housing associations who play a really active and progressive role in assisting local authorities with their homelessness functions, uh, who, who more than play their part. Uh, there, there are others who are, are, are less enthusiastic. And I think one of the things we need to clarify is that the Section 5 referral is actually a very powerful tool in the hand of a local authority. But many with, with the best of intentions have um, got involved in quite complex protocols uh, with uh, RSLs in their area, which almost get in the way of a straightforward referral. Uh, you know, the protocols... In, in, with the best will in the world, I've got all sorts of things like, you know, that the housing association would like to see the full support arrangements in place before a referral is made. And you understand that that would be the best thing, but sometimes that's not possible, and sometimes it would be better for the person to be housed and the support arrangement to follow very quickly behind that, for example. Okay. Um, Gordon, not for the first time, Mary's uh, strayed into somebody else's line of questioning. So, um, <laughs> have you got well, I, I've just really got one point. I was going to ask about vulnerable groups, but most of that's been covered. Um, but what I wanted you to comment on was the um, Scottish Housing Regulators report, Housing Options in Scotland of May 2014, stated... Local authorities have introduced effective referral schemes to help vulnerable people successfully move on from institutional care for ex-offenders, people discharged from hospitals and looked after children. So are there examples of good practice out there among local authorities in assisting vulnerable groups to find settled accommodation? And if so, how can we replicate that across all councils? The answer is yes, there, 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 there is good practice, but it is very much a postcode lottery. Uh, you know, we, we have really good um, guidelines about through care of young people, uh, and in some areas it's well implemented, in others at operational level. You, you know, young care leavers are forced to become homeless before they're assisted, which is, uh, um, you know, ridiculous. Uh, we have... In some areas, and, and, and particularly with long-term prisoners, there's often very good arrangements made because you have a long time to prepare and sort out a support arrangement and you know precisely when the person is going to leave. The problems often lie with short-term prison sentences. So similarly with hospitals, somebody leaving long-term hospital care, arrangements can be made quite well in advance. There's a lot, a lot of time. But with sh relatively short stays, it often happens too quickly for all those arrangements to be made. So I think there's, there's quite a lot of, of work to be done in the, these kind of shorter-term uh, arrangements and how to get them better, better working. And per perhaps health and social care integration gives an opportunity for some of the, the healthcare stuff to be done better. Uh, and uh, I, I hope there will be a... a because there's a, a general recognition that through care is a, a sort of one of the, the, the themes of the moment, that the Scottish Prison Service will... Um, be more involved, I suppose, in, in its through care responsibilities for prisoners who are leaving, particularly short-term prisoners. Um, I wouldn't want the committee to, to leave today and think that we've in any way uh, been negative about housing options. You know, let, let's be clear that this is a, a very a transformational mm. approach to delivering housing services for people. It has the potential to be extremely successful to, to really be person-centred, to, to, to lead to the right kinds of outcomes rather than just an administrative process that boxes are ticked and people are moved about. This is, has the, the, definitely has the potential to, to change the mindset and the way in which people with, with housing needs are dealt with. However, it's in its early days and we are seeing local authorities adapting and changing the way they deliver their services and that requires quite a big mind, mindset change, I think. 
What we are seeing from our, our own staff is that, um, that, that they are seeing cases where vulnerable people, including young people, potentially young people who've got lower levels of life skills, actually just haven't ever dealt with a local authority before, have never had to go through this sort of system, I find it very difficult to navigate what potentially is quite a complex set of arrangements, a complex system, needing to work with multiple agencies, IT systems, referral forms, and all of these things as acts as barriers to access, it acts as barriers to them actually getting what they need out of it. Now, Gary's referred to the fact that in some, some people know to come to shelter or to the law centre or to other advice services to help them through that, but often people don't. So what we really want to see as, as this system develops is that we look at the training of staff, the systems that are put in place, and actually auditing, assessing them from the point of view of that vulnerable person. What makes sense for them? Is it, is it person-centred? Does it really help them to get through from that period of crisis, which can be, you know, it, it can be, my mum's chucked me out. Um, she's locked the door on me and my, my bags are on the doorstep. How do you deal with that situation when you've got all those emotional um, issues to deal with as well. You've got to navigate a complex system. So really, as I say, what we want to see is, is better support, better training for staff, um, dealing with or, or, or understanding the process from the perspective of somebody who's vulnerable and in need, but very much that the Housing Options has the potential to be that kind of service. And you know, in many respects, we do welcome it, notwithstanding all the, the issues that we've just discussed about the potential there for gatekeeping. There's a number of things that we need to get right. We need to make sure there's a good supply of social housing. We need to make sure that the options that people are offered are right, that the statutory duties are there, and that, that staff know when it's appropriate to, to make that offer of a homelessness accept, uh, um, application. But fundamentally, that when somebody approaches their council in housing need that actually it's it's easy to get through that system and it's it's accessible for them i think that, that how you you make sure that local authorities have these things in place that you're speaking about is that you have a check in but you have something to check and balance the local authority so in places like we'll go back to glasgow you have my organization you have legal service agency where if somebody's released from prison and they're not getting the service they should they can come down to my agency and we'll take them back to the local authority and say, this is what you must do and this is what we will do if you don't. But what we've found is, and particularly this became apparent during the bedroom tax when we were quite well known, there was a lot of publicity. People were phoning us from all over Scotland and they had nowhere to go. They had no organisation to help them because either there wasn't anything or the organisation that was there was funded by the local authority, so wasn't really good at challenging the decisions that the local authority was making. So I guess this kind of rolls into what's happening with housing options is, is, is how do you make sure that that's, that's done properly and, and it ties in with that you have an organisation in each local authority and it wouldn't cost an awful lot of money to, to, to be able to represent people to make sure people were told what their rights were. Now, you're always going to have people that miss that system that, that, that don't know about coming. And, and I guess that's about the promotion of, the, of the, these organisations. But I think it's crucial that they're independent from the local authority and that they're independent from government. Because when there's independence, and, and my organisation is very independent from Glasgow City Council, you can challenge that local authority without worrying about whether you're going to be getting losing your job in two years' time. And, and I think that's quite important, and that would act as a way of making sure that each local authority does its ability, does make, meet its duties to vulnerable people, prison leavers, people with mental health problems, and, and people coming out of um, institutions. Um, I think there's, there's certainly certainly more that can be done, and there's, there's probably some some practical ways of, of doing that, for instance, is ensuring that, that sort of people are um, housed close to close to their support networks, um, which can be difficult when there's pressures on accommodation. But um, since we've seen people with um, complex health needs who the only temp temporary accommodation was 40 miles away, um, um, a young mother who's was moved away from the, the family home after she had a baby, um, and there was no support. Um, no accommodation available locally. Um, I think th that can have a big, a big difference in um, people's lives. Similarly, um, um, short-term hospital stays, um, with clients who um, have been discharged from hospital um, have lost their place in temporary accommodation or, um, or haven't previously had a place to, um, to stay. And... Um, that basically nobody has, has 
and to check of, have you got anywhere to stay tonight? So I think there's, there's, some, there's some simple things, but I think it's, it's certainly, um, certainly the steps have been taken in the right direction with, um, with the approach the local authorities are taking. Too much. All right, Mark. Okay, giving a, I've got a, a number of questions around about temporary accommodation. First, of just to ask if um, if you have any evidence of um, how local authorities' use of temporary accommodation has changed since the abolition abolition of priority need. I suppose um, to go back to the sort of very first remarks I made, the, the the initial legislation in two thousand and one was, I think, when. The, the big change happened because that gave right to temporary accommodation to all homeless applicants. And if you look at the, the statistics of presentations and so on, there was a big uh, leap when people suddenly got that right. So I think the, the, uh, the growth in the use of temporary accommodation has been uh, going since sort of 2002, 2003. And people, uh, the, the problem is the move on accommodation from that. And uh, there simply isn't the supply, it hasn't been helped by the bedroom tax, it hasn't been helped by uh, changes uh, to uh, housing benefit relating to the private rented sector where uh, um, it used to be that un people aged 25 and over could get self-contained accommodation, now it's, they've got to be 35 or over, so that it, there's a big pressure on um, smaller accommodation uh, and a kind of bottleneck which has grown up with single people caught in temporary accommodation. It's a combination of both greater entitlement to assistance for single people and a restriction on the options that are open to them in both the social and the private rented sector. So uh, um, the, I suppose the usage has grown. The types of temporary accommodation, though in Scotland, are very different from that in England because it's primarily... Uh, temporary accommodation in the social rented sector and there are some concerns down the way that perhaps the funding of temporary accommodation may, may change under the welfare reforms and produce a bit of a, 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 a penalty, um, financial penalty for local authorities which would be hard to, uh, hard to meet. So it's not been an instant thing since 2012 but there has been a large growth in temporary accommodation and it's one of the big issues about how we get rid of the bottleneck in temporary accommodation at the moment? Um, yes, so we, we are in a position at the moment where there is a huge pressure on temporary accommodation. Um, just at a time when, as, as Robert's indicated, there is pressure in, in future on the funding streams for that temporary <coughs> accommodation. Um, pressure caused not just by the change in the rights that people have, but, but on m probably more importantly, actually, on the fact that the availability of let's so the people moving out of temporary accommodation um, uh, is swift and, and, and it works effectively. And this actually, I think, is, is probably one of the, the most significant problems facing um, really addressing somebody's homelessness crisis because a huge amount of money is spent on temporary accommodation. It's an extremely expensive resource. Um, but it's also an absolutely pivotal one. That it was, it was it, 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 you know, vastly important that somebody who is in housing crisis gets a place in, in a good quality temporary let to help them out of that crisis. It should be a stepping stone. And so we want stays in temporary accommodation to be as short as possible. It should be a time when you, you immediately deal with that crisis. You put in place support if necessary, and somebody moves on very quickly into a permanent let. And we, what we don't want to see is what we're increasingly fearing, that people are spending longer and longer in temporary accommodation. We currently don't have figures um, as to, to how long people are spending. It's they're not, they're not publicly available. However, um, it's something we think we should be putting more focus on really as, as a, a, um, a priority for government in terms of where they can most focus resources in preventative spend, it should be on good provision of good quality temporary accommodation. So the, the two things that need to happen, one is we need to increase the supply of social housing, we need to make sure people have pathways out of temporary accommodation as quickly as possible by making sure there is enough Home, um, there is enough social housing available for people but secondly we need to make sure that the temporary accommodation that people get is of a good high standard 
um, we have been calling on the government to implement standards for temporary accommodation, not just covering the physical standard, you know, making sure that we, we don't see instances where people are put in really grotty hovels, to be honest. You know, we're seeing people put in accommodation where the walls are dripping um, with, with condensation and mould, where we have drafty windows that really you wouldn't want to spend any time in at all. We need to make sure that's right. But we also need to make sure that what surrounds the temporary accommodation, that the support that's put in place for people to, to help make that accommodation a really valuable time spent um, is in place. So we want to see national standards for temporary accommodation that all local authorities have to follow. I mean, I have had issues locally with temporary accommodation in terms of the quality, and I think that, that's an excellent point. The other issues that I had you know, were around about um, costs. For those who aren't on any form of housing benefits, sometimes temporary accommodation can can put someone into a worse position than they, than they have been already, and also um, round about concentration of temporary um, accommodation tend to find that those um, houses in hard to let areas um, it, it's then making the problem worse, where there's a, a constant turnover um, of tenants in particular particular areas, which mean that um, sometimes going into quite chaotic areas just because of that high level of turnover. I wonder if any of you have any comments on that. Talk about the, the cost. More, more, what's happening more often in, in my organisation is that people who are working are becoming homeless because they, they either can't afford their rent or, or, or obviously they're maybe working less so they've got less money. So they're presenting to the local authority and this goes back to gatekeeping where where people are saying, you know, you can't afford to, to come into homelessness or you'll need to give your job up, which is, you know, an utterly ridiculous position to hold. Uh, our advice is usually to say to the person, you know, pay what you would pay if you were in a social housing. And to be fair to Glasgow City Council, they've actually been quite good in, you know, not pursuing these debts because, you know, for temporary accommodation, a temporary furnished flat can be anything between two and £250 a week. And if you're working, I mean, I, I couldn't afford to pay £250 a week for, for, I don't think, anybody could. And I think that, that some guidance for the government would be quite, quite quite helpful in that because I think more working people are becoming poor and it, it becoming homeless. And if they're going to their local authority and they're being told you can't afford accommodation in homelessness, they're then going to stay with an uncle or an aunt. And that's then, I guess you would call that prejudice because they have been treated differently because they're working and they're being told you can't access homeless accommodation when they actually can because you shouldn't be priced out of getting into homelessness. That's a, a position that, that, that can't be held and I think that the government should maybe, maybe offer some guidance on that to local authorities. Certainly we've seen some cases where um, people have been placed in temporary accommodation that's too expensive for their needs. Um, one example where um, a client was in financial difficulties, um, built up rent arrears and was evicted, um, was allocated temporary accommodation, um, but the rent was even higher than the, the property that he'd, that he'd just left, which wasn't full at all. Um, and certainly he was um, working and, and able to claim housing benefit. Um, the bedroom tax certainly um, an impact as well in terms of um, if I, the only accommodation available is is too large, then people being subjected to the bedroom tax. Um, we've seen cases where um, service charges have been applied for, for furnishings, for white goods that have caused people to um, to be unable to, to cope financially. Um, so I think there's um, there's quite a bit that could be could be done around around that in terms of making sure that the the accommodation isn't too um, isn't too expensive um, for the person's needs to exacerbate sort of other money problems that they might have. Uh, there is yes a significant issue about how much temporary accommodation costs. Um, it costs a lot to actually deliver temporary accommodation. What you're paying for isn't just the, the rent of the property, but all the services that go along with that. And there is an additional cost for local authorities, as we've mentioned, people moving in and out of the accommodation frequently. Um, 
for people who are out of work, the full cost of their temporary accommodation, where that's provided by the local authority, is currently met by housing benefit. Um, and there's a suggestion in the future that that might not be the case. This has prompted the government to work with local authorities to try and do some modelling of the cost of temporary accommodation. And that's the first real insight I think we've had into how temporary accommodation is, is what, what, what the costs cover and what sort of costs we're looking at. And the modelling has shown that, yes, it is extremely costly to local authorities to provide accommodation. Um, I think it, it really underlines again the fact that, that if, if temporary accommodation is so expensive and it is so important as a stepping stone out of homelessness, we need to make sure it's actually delivering on that and we're getting the value for money that we need from, from, from funding that temporary accommodation. It needs to meet the, the right standards to help people move out of homelessness and into a permanent stable home. I think I just add very briefly that, that there has been some important work done to, to look at costs of different types of temporary accommodation. And I suppose one of the uh, fairly obvious but uh, uh, the irony is, is that the more temporary temporary accommodation is, the higher the cost because there's a high throughput of people, therefore furniture and so on gets worn out more quickly. Uh, wear and tear costs are, are much higher, management costs are much higher. Um, uh, and I think that's one of the problems about how the uh, Westminster government currently is looking at the funding of temporary accommodation is it's basing it around people staying for lengthy periods in temporary accommodation, which is the case, for example, in London. Uh, but if we're organising temporary accommodation in the best way it should be, which is people there for short periods, it will be relatively expensive, but people won't be there for long. And I think that's, 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 that's quite important. I suppose the, the, the other fairly uh, obvious thing to say is that one of the, the key things we need to do, and one of the things that housing options is all about, is about stopping people having to go into temporary accommodation in the first place. And if we actually reduce the inflow to temporary accommodation, we can perhaps deal with some of the bottleneck. And so I think you know, housing options has got a big role to play in ensuring that we prevent homelessness, prevent people having to go into temporary accommodation where that's at all possible. Um, Jim. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask about the housing support duty that was introduced uh, through regulations in 2012 and which came into effect on the 1st of June of last year, uh, which requires local authorities to assess the need for housing support for every homeless applicant who's assessed as unintentionally homeless or threatened with homelessness. Um, I wanted to ask if you believe that the housing support services, as prescribed in the regulations, hits the mark. Is it specifying uh, all of the support services that it would need to, uh, and which can therefore be identified and provided by local authorities? And then secondly, how successful uh, over the last year have local authorities been in implementing uh, the duty in order, you know, given that the purpose is to prevent homeless people from um, taking on a tenancy and, not, and then not being able to sustain that tenancy? I can start. We, we Shelter Scotland recently published a, a research review of the implementation of the housing support uh, duty, a duty which we called for very strongly and were very pleased to see that the government accepted and was implemented. Um, from this early assessment, I say it's relatively early assessment, just six months into the duty, um, we, we have established that actually some of the fears that were expressed by local authorities um, when, when the duty was implemented have generally not materialised, that most local authorities found that they were already meeting the requirements of the duty, and some found that actually the duty itself had a very beneficial impact on the services. It had built on existing processes, sharpened focus, and, and created a, a more, more um, well, fostered joint working, I suppose, to, to create uh, more, the leverage for more resources in some areas. So generally across Scotland, the picture is very positive. People are implementing the duty, taking it in stride, and actually having a duty has put a renewed focus on provision of support and looking at innovative ways of bringing in support that's required um, if, it, if it may not already be there. So there are potentially some, some areas for improvement, as you would expect, um, when a new duty is applied. And we're looking particularly to, to how um, the housing support duty might be linking to other kinds of support which is provided, such as support for young people or employability. 
Um, and again, looking to the future, looking at the, the plans to integrate health and social care services, what impact that's going to have on provision of housing support specifically, and making sure that actually these things don't sit in separate silos, that it, it needs to be person-centred. We need to look at the needs of that individual, some of which will be for housing support, but some of which may be <coughs> support provided by other providers. Making sure that, that, that that's taken and there's a corporate approach taken to, to assessing support and to understanding what the needs of an individual are and then the provision of that support is available. Yeah, we, we, too under, we, we undertook a, a, I suppose a quick and dirty survey uh, of uh, um, local authorities uh, uh, asking some very basic questions and uh, 24 local authorities responded, uh, which was a, a good response. And I would echo uh, most of what Rosemary was... <laughs> no, 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 there, there can be all kinds of reasons why people don't. It's not compulsory, and, uh, and we always agree not to name anybody <laughs> on grounds that may incriminate them. Um, but uh, the, they, they, they generally said that uh, it had made no particular difference to what they were already doing. It was largely... Uh, the, the, the duty was f formalising the good practice that they were generally doing. Now, it may be that the 24 who responded were the 24 best, uh, um, but I think that has been generally the, the view. We had expressed a concern when the support duty was being uh, considered that because there's a, a statutory duty to provide housing support at the time of crisis of homelessness, that it might draw funds away from more preventative support or, or support for uh, tenancy sustainment. Um, I'm glad that, our, that, that those fears were, at this stage, appeared to be uh, unfounded. And uh, the responses we got from this uh, uh, um, survey were showing that funding had not been removed from preventative services. So I, I, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. But I think it's something that, if, if as seems likely, resources are going to become tighter and tighter in local authorities, we need to keep an eye on, because actually the preventative you know, a pound of preventative support, low-level preventative support, can often save an awful lot more than the pound at the time of crisis. Can I just come back to you on that? Uh, you said that, um, according to the responses to the survey, that it, the, it appeared to be formalising. You know, the, the, the introduction of the, the duty appeared to be formalising good practice. In that case, has it made any difference in actually driving, um, and, you know, the dissemination of good practice more widely across the country? Well, there, was the, 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 there were two other bit, parts of the survey, two questions which I thought were quite interesting. Uh, one was that uh, a number of local authorities said that it had, it, and actually some of the voluntary sector responses we'd had to another survey had said it, it had created better joint working uh, practices. So that's, that's still evolving. So I think, I think that, that is good. Um, and... I've lost my thread for the second bit. <laughs> well, we, I think our, our, our research has supported that as well, that we, we found many local authorities had said that some were already exceeding the duty, but even where that was the case, what had happened is it triggered a review of what was happening with housing support. It had um, pro promoted and, um, and often instituted a, a corporate approach to providing support. And having a duty meant there was now a, a real focus on delivery of that duty, which means that as future challenges become, um, and some of them I've referred to around health and social care, but also the self-directed support agenda and looking at some of these specialist support services, housing support was now properly considered as part of those. And, you know, this is really is a good example of where um, a, a, a legislative duty can promote and, and enforce that preventative approach within local authorities to really take a, a good look at how you can prevent future homelessness and, and future. If, if there was one thing that perhaps I would suggest that, that maybe does need a bit more look and review is that the fact that this duty doesn't apply if you're intentionally homeless. And I know, as we've already discussed, there may be a, an issue there. Clearly, um, somebody who, who becomes homeless, whether it's intentional or unintentional, in fact, people who are intentionally homeless may well be in need of, of perhaps even more housing support than somebody who's unintentionally homeless um, to, to get out of that. That's excellent. Before we come to Mr Burns, Mr... Is it Gowans? Sorry. Um, my eyesight's failing me. Uh, could you perhaps, in your answer, illustrate um, some examples of what good housing support services look like? I think sort of good... Good support services would um, consider the needs of the the individual um, and work to 
find what what would be the best option for for them in terms of sort of moving um, moving out of temporary accommodation. Um, on if, if they were found to be intentionally homeless to support them to um, get into a sustained tenancy. Um, particular groups, um, people with um, um, mental health difficulties, young people, people living in prison, um, people who've had a previous history of um, antisocial behaviour and rent arrears who just caused a problem for the local authority before. Um, I think probably guidance around um, um, some of these areas that, that could be incorporated with um, um, with the housing options guidance um, would be helpful in terms of how you support someone who um, who may may not um, first on say no I don't need any support um, who may have um, sort of had previous um, issues with the local authority as a landlord um, to to try and resolve <coughs> resolve difficulties and as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I think sort of ensuring that people are sort of housed close to their their own support work support networks will make a big difference. Mr. Burns. I think just following up from that, in, in terms of you know all the housing support agencies, they have great mission statements, and, and you know we all say the same thing. But I think it's about staff, and, and when I say that, quite a lot of the housing support agencies pay just slightly above the minimum wage, so anybody who gets any good experience in there can and becomes good. They'll leave to go and get a better wage somewhere else, but, but I guess that's a, a separate issue. In terms of this legislation, I think it's great, and I think it's so great that it should be extended. And by that, I mean when people are going to become homeless, we know they're going to become homeless. Somebody knows their housing association knows, and currently we've got Section 11 notifications in place where there's financial eviction going to be taking place. The so local authorities informed. If we're putting homeless, if we're putting tenancy system in after they become homeless. It's not a great step of logic to think that maybe we can get in there before they become homeless and, and create some kind of duty there where you stop the homelessness happening in the first place and the tenancy system and stays there until they get to a stable period in their lives where the, 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 that, that support can be withdrawn. Now, anytime I come here, everything I say sounds like it's going to cost money, but in actuality, it, it doesn't because you, if you stop a family from becoming homeless, the, you know, the figures say that that's up between ten and twenty thousand pounds you've just saved the local authority. And if you stop them from becoming homeless and, and getting that tenancy system in place before the homelessness occurs, I, I think that would be a positive step. Can, can I ask a question about the situation facing um, young people? Um, Mr. Aldridge, you mentioned the latest homelessness statistics earlier and Looking at those, there's a statistic which, and a trend that's highlighted, which is that in 2006 to 2007, 15,000 people aged 24 or under were assessed as homeless or potentially homeless. But by 2013-14, this had dropped to 8,321, a decrease of 44%. Now, does that suggest that we're getting it right? Um, that we are um, currently. Uh, and, uh, well, well, I think I think actually the, the, the uh, I think actually it goes back to some of the issues that were raised in the report by the housing regulator on housing options, and uh, there's been a really welcome increase in the use of mediation services uh, by local authorities uh, right across uh, uh, Scotland uh, as a means of trying to prevent homelessness. Uh, it, the, the, it has not always been at the right time. It has not always been appropriate. And I think some young people are uh, turned away. So I think there's a, there's a mixture there of really good practice that's been going on with people being helped to find solutions before they become homeless. And that, that's to be welcomed. But I think there's also an element in there of people uh, being turned away. And perhaps you know, when, when you're young, uh, younger and less experienced in understanding what's uh, being said to you, the tone of voice that's being used in, you know, you might, you might as well you know, not bother, you're better off where you are, um, uh, uh, will, will prevent people from making a homeless application. So I think there'll be both elements, both positive, but a bit, a bit, of, a bit of gatekeeping perhaps involved in that. I think that if we're talking about a 44% decrease since 2006, we are you know, young people have less access to housing benefit, there's less jobs, there's less money, uh, I think that maybe the statistics are is hiding the fact that young people were simply not 
presenting for homelessness assistance and, and they're stuck in this hidden homelessness that's the kind of this is kind of thing that, that, that we all know about, but, but it's, it's very difficult and it's notoriously difficult to find out what's happened for that. And again, I, I would put out that, you know, if, I, I think that there has been some practice at changes and, and obviously that has had some impact, but you know, I don't think that you can say that with the facts that we know about how young people's access to housing and, and funding and money has decreased, how could that manifest itself into there being less young homeless people. I just think that they're not presenting or that we're missing them. And I think that we should do something about that. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Um, if, if you don't mind me adding, you know, I, th I think that there is a mixed picture. Yes, there is some really good examples of mediation being used with families um, to, to prevent homelessness happening amongst young people. But going back to things we were talking earlier about uh, the housing options approach. If, if you're approaching your local authority for help, you think you've made a homeless application only to find out later it was actually a housing options interview you had. There, there are clearly some issues, I think, for, for young people navigating the system and understanding, plus the fact that actually temporary accommodation isn't a great place to be. And if you think you're going to be there for a long time as a young person, you may choose to, to, to stay at home and put up with often an intolerable situation rather than knowing that you're going to be spending a long period of time in temporary accommodation so we need to get housing supply right we need to get housing options right and we need to get those preventative services that, that potentially can mediate between families and young people much better there's been a suggestion that the westminster government i don't always believe everything that i read in the newspapers but a suggestion that the westminster government may be considering uh, altering the eligibility criteria uh, for housing benefit for under 25s um, have you considered or assessed what the impact of that would, that policy change of removing housing benefit for under 25s would be on homelessness in Scotland? I think we would all say it's a disaster. Well, I think one of the um, most uh, one of the encouraging things is that uh, regardless of the referendum result, it appears that all parties have a view that housing benefit uh, will be uh, largely controlled, if not totally controlled by the Scottish Parliament and I think we've got a very good opportunity with that um, across parties to build a, a, a situation where those young people who need rent subsidy, uh, who happen to be under 25, are assisted and don't fall into homelessness because it would be not only homelessness but destitution, I believe. Um, it, it would be disastrous, I think, and, and let, let's not forget, it, 25 might seem very young, but there are plenty of 25-year-olds with young families and, and, and people in that situation. If such a thing were to happen, obviously we would be arguing very strongly to prevent it and to, to ensure there are the right safeguards there. But clearly you can't provide uh, the, the level of um, rights and services that we have in Scotland that are absolutely world-renowned for, for dealing with homelessness when you have a situation that some people below the age of 25 will be excluded from those because they can't get access to the, the sort of subsidy that would be needed to make that service deliverable. Just simply the worst thing to happen to homelessness that I could ever think of would have happened in my time in working in homelessness. It would be awful. Yeah, we'd, we'd also be very concerned about sort of the, the suggestion of the, the age um, being put in place. I think this, it's basically um, people under 25 won't necessarily have um, sort of the suggestion being that they can stay with their parents, that that's not an, an option for, um, for a number of people. I think it would be, it'd be something that would, that would seriously concern us. Grateful to you, for your indulgence. Can I ask one final mm -hmm. question? On housing option hubs, in 2010, five housing option hubs were created by the Scottish Government in order to promote um, housing options approach to homelessness and to share best practice across um, Scotland's 32 local authorities. Um, with a budget of just under £1 million, uh, £950,000, in fact, of enabling funding, have you any comments um, on how the housing option hubs are developing? across Scotland and what the impact of these has been? It's very, very briefly, you know, hubs are a good idea. It's a really potentially very positive forum to allow discussion and, and sharing of, of um, 
a practice, best practice between local authorities, looking at cross-border cross potentially sharing of resources or enabling resources. And in some, hub, some, hub, sorry, 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 in some hub areas, this is working very effectively, and we think it's been a very positive response. But we do know that there's a lot of variation between hubs. We're still reasonably early days in terms of delivering this radical new approach to, to providing services for, for people in housing need. We, we would suggest that perhaps hubs need to be looking more outwardly focused and, and perhaps to looking at how, that, how they can maximise the availability of options for accommodation for people. But I think what, one thing that the regulator has underlined is that, that this approach to delivering a housing options system in Scotland has worked very well, but it's not enough on its own. We need strong standards, strong national standards, national guidelines um, and guidance for, for delivering housing options to, to really... I really embed the, the good practice that we've seen develop in some areas of Scotland across the whole of Scotland. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, th I think the experience has been largely positive. There are some that are, 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 are more uh, progressive than others, I think. But, uh, and, and I think they will continue to evolve in, in, in a constructive way. But there, are, there have been some concerns expressed that uh, they need to, a number need to be more inclusive of the voluntary sector, uh, that I think a number would benefit from greater health involvement. I think actually given the way uh, that the, um, the welfare reforms are going, it would be useful to involve um, people from the Department of Work and Pensions, Job Centre, in the, to, to, to get a, 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 a broader approach towards the, the holistic uh, 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 way of working to prevent homelessness, which, uh, which is you know, what we're all after. Just following on from Jim's question about the possible removal of housing benefit um, to under 25s, there's also been a suggestion um, by the UK government that they'll, they'll consider lowering, lowering the housing benefit cap outside London, you know, possibly as low as £18,000. What effect would that have on hopeless, homelessness in Scotland and young families? The, the, the pattern of how the caps affected households in Scotland, um, I think as somebody's already referred to, a lot of these reforms actually are focusing on the problems that, that are experienced by the, the, the housing market in the southeast of England. They have a different impact in Scotland, and when we look at particularly at the housing benefit cap, we can see that the, the, a large number of people it affects are people in temporary accommodation where their housing costs are very high for the reasons we've already discussed. So clearly any re further reduction in, um, in the cap is going to affect those same people and add additional pressures onto the local authority who's delivering that accommodation. There, and I think one of the things that, that the recent modelling of the cost of temporary accommodation has shown is potentially there's going to be a funding gap that we can't rely on housing benefit to fund the temporary accommodation and that in Scotland, if we believe in the role that temporary accommodation has to play and we believe in what Scotland is trying to achieve in, in delivering homelessness uh, services to people, we need to look and address that gap in funding um, and make sure that, that people aren't left out and suffering because of decisions uh, around housing benefit reform. Well, I mean, the impact of that, we're already feeling it, and it's not exclusively, but it's mostly when it's not temporary accommodation. It's, it's large families that are living in private sector flats that the local authority just can't accommodate because if they've got seven or eight children, there's certain duties about who should each have a room and a, a family can choose to go into a private flat and, and rent that and, you know, get a five or six bedroom house. But they're already been hit by... and they've already been hit by the housing benefit cap as it stands and, and it would obviously make that a lot worse if there was any, any further erosions. Okay, uh, Alex. Thank you, convener. Uh, I noticed Shelter Scotland uh, submission makes comments about the increasing number of applications from households living in the private sector. Uh, would it be possible for the panel to uh, comment on the levels of homelessness among people who have lived in the private sector previously? That, that yes, the proportion of homeless applicants um, who have come from a private let has increased. Um, in, in absolute numbers, it's, it's fallen, but that's fallen not at the same rate as, as homelessness applications have overall. So um, we've seen a growth from 13% to 18% between 2008, 2009, 2013, 14. That suggests that I think we need to be really looking quite carefully at why people are having to leave the private rented sector and make a homeless application. 
Clearly, there's going to be some issues there around affordability in the private rented sector, but potentially also suitability. Um, we have consistently, Shelter, have been looking at um, the, the, what, what you get for a private let. What, what do you get? What kind of standards? Um, relationships with the landlord, repairs issues, but also issues around stability um, in the private rented sector and security. A private let at the moment is no more secure than, than your minimum tenancy period, often six months, and then after that you're on a month-by-month -month rolling contract. And you, you can be asked to leave at any time. If you're, an, again, increasing numbers of young families and families in general are spending time in the private rented sector because they have no other options. There isn't enough social housing. People who would normally have had a social let spending time in, so, in the private rented sector under those levels of insecurity. And I think quite clearly where there are pressures in the market and landlords are seeking to evict people or, or asking people to leave, um, people often have no choice but to go and make a homeless application. So how should local authorities be using the private rented sector in the context of housing options approach to homelessness? I think carefully. Um, just as when you make uh, a, a, when you when you are, uh, have a homeless application and your duty towards you can be discharged into the private rented sector, but only with very certain criteria, you have to agree to it. It has to be affordable. You have to be given uh, a, you know a longer let than than is normal. Um, we also need to be looking at when assessing somebody for, through the housing options approach. Is, the, that, is that private rented let the, the best option for them? Is it going to give them afford, affordable housing? Is it going to be secure for them? Are they going to be able to sort of, you know, make a stable home in the private rented sector? And some of that will be to do with the individual capabilities of, of that household and, and the local market. I mean, clearly, the, the private rented sector is very different across Scotland. Um, we've been talking about island and rural communities earlier on. And, and very often where there is a shortage of, of social housing in, in any concentration across the uh, rural and, and island Scotland, the private rent sector may very well be the best solution for that, for that family and for that household. But we need to be using it very carefully and thinking carefully about how sustainable is that kind of accommodation or are we just putting somebody else into a situation where they're going to, um, to, to find themselves in housing crisis down the line. I think, having said all of that, um, we do welcome the Scottish Government's review of the private rented sector tenancy. I think one of the key things that we, we want to see is, is to create a, a, a private rented sector for the future of Scotland that is more secure, offers that kind of stability. It needs to work for landlords too. We don't want to reduce supply of accommodation, but we need to be saying, if private renting is going to play a greater role in meeting housing need in the future, how can we, how can we get it to work effectively for people? I would echo that. I mean, I, I, I think one of the, the key things is that the private rented sector has to have a role to play because it's, it's quite large in Scotland. Um, often uh, private rented accommodation can be in a, a, a better location than, this, than the social rented options that people would have, but it comes with a whole lot of risks which need to be made clear to people. And it is about affordability, but most importantly, it's about security. And that's where I think that the uh, current discussions about reforming the private rented sector tenancy are so important because if you have a family and you want to get your child settled in a school you need to know that you can maintain that tenancy in that area and your child can continue to, to go to that school for the medium uh, or, or long term. Currently with the private rented sector you're basically on one month's notice uh, of, of removal legally so, and, and it makes it a very difficult option for people who are trying to either invest in their community uh, or to make long-term plans for their future and escape from what's a very, un very unsettling and unsettled position of being homeless. And, and there is a particular issue for young people in the private rental sector, particularly if, if you're on a low income or if on no income currently you're only entitled to, uh, to housing benefit to cover the, the, the cost of a room in a shared accommodation if you're under 25. That is it, it is having an impact on, on the clients that we're seeing, people who are, are unable to afford self-contained accommodation when they may have shared access to children, for example. Um, the, the, the pressures that are there for young people in those circumstances are quite significant. I think as well, not just for folks that are on housing benefit, for people that are working in the private sector is a very expensive option. And, you know, there's something unfair and if you're renting a flat from the private sector and your next door neighbour has a, has a social flat, a social landlord flat, there's a, there's a difference about £200 a month in that and if you're working on minimum wage that's a, 
an excessive amount of your money was going to rent for the exact same house as your neighbour. And, you know, plenty of people that have approached us have come through where they are in a private let and they can, maybe their hours have been cut and they can no longer afford t to pay for their home. So we would kind of ask, and, and we've said it before, for the Scottish Government to look into the, the, the costs, not just the, the tenures, but the costings of private sector renting to see if there's anything that can be done for the benefit of people who are not just on, well, not for people on the housing benefit, because the majority of that's picked up by the taxpayer, but for people who are working where, where there's an unfairness where their neighbour pays, you know, £200 a month less than what they're paying. Yeah, I think that um, the affordability and security of tenure are, are sort of important um, in general terms. In terms of um, specifically um, the private what more can the private sector do? Um, I think that um, we still see cases where um, where people are illegally evicted, um, and I think it's to, to sort of clamp down on the sort of the, the minority of, of landlords who would um, 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 who would basically sort of lock the doors and throw people's belongings on the street. Um, there's also a role I think for local authorities to. Um, recognise the situation people are being in. Um, seen a couple of cases where um, refused um, to make a homeless application because um, the landlord hadn't submitted the, the sort of the appropriate notice to quit forms um, and the rest of it. Whereas the the clients were saying, well, basically they won't do that. We're going to be sort of sort of out on the street in the next couple of days um, um, unless sort of something. Um, something changes, um, and I think sort of um, um, some action around sort of um, repairs in the, the private rent sector, particularly around sort of temporary accommodation. Um, we can find there um, there can be quite a delay in getting repairs done. There's disputes over who's responsible for the repairs, and that can lead to sort of some some very poor quality accommodation. Um, so I think there's a few. Is that that sort of um, the private sector and the uh, local authorities can, can work together to improve things? Okay, I see I've been allocated the the free hit question here, so I will ask it. Are there any other comments you wish to make on how housing options and homelessness services could be improved? I think I'd just like to finish by by reiterating, I think what we, we've all said and agreed all along that the housing options approach is only as good as the options that are actually available to people at the end. Um, we need, as a, as a country, to, to, to properly invest in, in more housing across the board, but particularly more affordable social rented housing. We, we know that we're consistently building far less each year than, than, than what is needed to, to meet the minimum affordable housing needs. We, we need around 10,000 new homes a year in Scotland to meet this growing need. And until we get to that situation where there is enough housing options and enough affordable homes available for people, we're always going to have a pressure on allocating scarce resources. Clearly, in the meantime, before we get to that point, um, we need to make sure that housing options is working effectively. We very much welcome the guidance that the government is, is going to bring forward. We would like to be part of, of creating and drafting that guidance. And we're also looking for the government to, to, to really to set homelessness up for the next 10 years, to say we, we've, we've achieved a lot in Scotland. We, we've transformed the way that we deal with people who are in housing need. We need to maintain that, progress, that progressive movement. We need to keep the focus on homelessness. Look to the next 10 years and say, where do we want to be then? What kinds of things do we need to work on now and put in place? So we're looking for a, an action plan effectively for the next 10 years in Scotland. Okay, anyone else? Any further questions? No? Well, thank you very much for that. That was um, um, very helpful. Um, I think there's, uh, we'll pass what you've said on to the Equal Ops Committee because I think at the moment they're looking at homelessness specifically among um, young people. Um, but thank you all very much. And can I suspend for five minutes for a comfort break and allow the witnesses to leave the room? Thank you.
Okay, um, we will resume and move on to agenda item three, which is public petitions. Um, we have to consider public petition PE1481 on blacklisting in Scotland. The committee has received a response from the petitioners, which is included in the cover note from, for this item. Um, can I invite comments or views from members on this petition? Um, yep. I think the petitioners have um, performed a very valuable service, which has helped inform um, the um, development of the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill when it was going through its um, legislative stages uh, and helped improve the legislation by highlighting what is a, a very important issue. Um, as a result, um, there has been extensive dialogue, as I understand it, between the Scottish Government and the trade unions, which has resulted in extensive guidance and also the promise of um, secondary legislation. So I'd be very much in favour of keeping the petition open so that we can um, keep the issue under review and, if appropriate, at a later stage, um, seek further evidence about what the implementation of the guidance and any subsequent legislation uh, has been. Anyone else? Yeah, Alex. Uh, my instinct to these things is always to say, oh, this is a historical problem and it's no problem anymore. But I've no evidence to support that view uh, in this case. I would like to think that this is a solved problem, but I, th I would agree with Jim. I think we should keep an eye on this uh, and ensure that uh, there isn't a problem still there that has to be dealt with. Ms. Mark? I would agree. Yeah. Um, with Jim as well, I think there have been steps taken through the Procurement Reform Bill which were welcomed by the petitioners. I'd perhaps just ask if we could possibly write to the, the Scottish Government just on the, the final um, point, just to ask whether the Government have any intention of um, instructing a, a public inquiry on blacklisting. I think there are some pretty serious things mentioned in this um, reply uh, from Pat Rafferty. Um, and, yeah, I, I think I'd agree with you, Mark. I think we need to write to the Scottish Government with a copy of this, asking them for the comments on it and, you know, what progress has been made, you know, what have the discussions been with the trade unions um, on further guidance on this. OK? Yeah. Right, so we'll be right to write to the Scottish Government and see what they come back with. Right, that's agenda item three. Uh, so that means that we now move into a private se session as agreed earlier.